I will now call our January 16, 2024 meeting to order. Thank you to those attending in person tonight and those staying engaged by watching our recording at a later time. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak to our community comment, they will need to fill out our speaker form located in the lobby on the table and turn it in to Board Secretary Kim Colvin, seated at the end on my left. Comments will take place during the designated community comment portion. Before we move into tonight's agenda, I want to take a moment to introduce those seated at the table with me. To my right, Superintendent Degner, Directors Abraham, East Ham, and Williams. To my left, we have Vice President Clausen, Directors Finch, and Lingo, and Board Secretary Cohen. And with that, we will dive into tonight's agenda. Um, I don't see any of our student reps. Correct? Okay. Next up is the ICEA update from President Brady <coughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, President Malone and directors, uh, Superintendent, De Superintendent Degner. It's nice to be in school building. I guess you have to start with that. And uh, I want to just first say, too, I know Jeff's not here, but just, just to publicly say to Jeff Barnes and the facilities folks, the custodial crew, is just a huge thank you. It's a massive undertaking with the amount of snow that we've uh, received and then the freezing weather on top of it. So it's almost impossible to sort of concrete and cement down onto the on the pavement, so I urge the public to be patient with us tomorrow. You know, it's still going to be slow going. Try to get out ahead of it if you can, and also to my colleagues, just be patient because it is going to be a little bit slower um, tomorrow morning. But huge shout out to them. That's a lot of work, and they have really done an excellent job. Um, two other things: Saturday, January twenty seventh, is the uh, League of Women Voters of Johnson County's Education Forum. So just to put on folks' calendars, that's a Saturday morning, nine thirty to eleven thirty. Uh, at the Iowa City Area Senior Center. The district is a co-sponsor, ICEA is a co-sponsor, that's their education focus one. And of course the session has started, and so I urge <coughs> all of us to, as we can, of course stand true to our principles and our beliefs, but also I think it's really important that we build bridges uh, this legislative session so that we can make some headway on important items that I think are, you know, some, we have common ground on, you know, child care, there's proposals about teacher salaries that are out there. So really do look to build some bridges with folks that you talk to. I think we have some good opportunities. So thanks. Thank you. And we do not have any community comments for tonight. So next up, I would seek a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I move for approval of the agenda for January 16th. Second. Board Secretary Colvin, ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up, did anyone have any questions regarding the bill review this Time around, I'm seeing head shakes, so we will move on. Are there items that directors would like to pull from tonight's consent agenda? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. We move that we approve tonight's consent agenda. Second. Board Second. Secretary Colvin, ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is a public hearing for the 2024 Playground Improvements Project. Vice President Clausen. Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the proposed plans and specifications for the 2024 Playground Improvements Project. The Board of Directors set the date for this public hearing on December 12, 2023. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on December 13, 2023. The district will receive bids on this project at 2 p.m. January 12, 2024 at the Facilities Management Conference Center, 1137 South Riverside Drive, Iowa City, Iowa. Notice to contractors was published as required by law in multiple statewide plan rooms and on the Iowa City Community School District website on December 13, 2023. Are there any questions from the board? 
I guess I have one question. Uh, just as I read this, I noticed it in the document it says January um, 2023, so we might want to change that. Are there any questions from the public? Thank you. Hearing none, I will close that public hearing. Next up, we have policy review, and it's policy 405.2 for licensed employees, qualifications, recruitment, selection. And forgive me, do you still share it, Director Finch? So, so far. Okay. So far. But so. <laughs> it looks like we're only uh, changing a word here, PYOA to IOWorks.gov, correct? Yeah, this one was kind of out of order, out of sequence. We had just found a typo with the state's uh, change in platform. We need to switch that over to from Teach Iowa to Iowa Works. Great. Any additional comments from directors? Hearing none, we will move to our first presentation tonight, Chapter 103 update. And it's the yeah, so Director Reedy is going to lead that presentation for us. It uh, looks like Chase was going to give the intro, so I'll let him go ahead and proceed with that. <laughs> Thanks, Superintendent Dunner. Good evening. Um, we're happy to present this data to you this evening. Um, we have in the past had presented this kind of a standalone, but our goal has been to start incorporating this into the annual uh, progress report that we gave to you last month. And so the data you're going to see tonight to help align that is going to be uh, data from our last year because that's the data we provided in the AP. <coughs> so we're going to stand alone this evening, a reflection of last year, and as we move forward, we'll incorporate it into the APR so it is uh, relevant alongside all the other important data that we provide you on an annual basis rather than putting it on um, a standalone platform. So uh, we apologize that we didn't have it ready to go when we provided the APR, but we're happy to share that this evening. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Director Reedy. Thank you. So as uh, Deputy Superintendent Reedy shared, we are just going to briefly look at last year's data. Um, it's honestly really exciting for me to be able to share this information with you because overall it continues to be really positive. Um, and I want to start with just giving a huge shout out to our building teams. Our administrators and teachers and paraeducators all work really hard to um, get the information, to get the results you see before you today. And it's our commitment to serving all students, meeting them where they're at, and providing the services they deserve. Um, and it's, it's really the people working with our students that have helped us to achieve this. So I wanted to just, again, it's always helpful to think about where we were. <laughs> um, even though it's hard to see this information, um, I think it's important to remember <coughs> how far we've come. So this is our data from 2017 to 2018 and then 2018 to 2019. We haven't included the 2920, 1920 and 2021 data due to the pandemic and other um, impact to that data set. And our 22-23 data is shown here, and that is shown in comparison to the previous year, 21-22. So, um, this last year is dark blue, and as you can see, in almost every area, we were down. And here's that number, that data represented in the table, if that's visually easier for you to digest. And again, this is hopefully you guys had an opportunity to review this, so I'm not going to read the numbers to you. I did want to talk a little bit about some of the processes and structures we put in place the last year, um, to I think that I think helped contribute to this information. So three years ago, we were reviewing our Chapter 103 data monthly. Last year, um, you'll remember in our presentation from our team, we moved to a weekly review. This year, we review our, our data daily. And why that's important is it allows us to provide on, um, student by student coaching and support to our administrators and teams so that we can use every case study as a growth and learning opportunity, as well as talk about um, problem solving and where we might need to um, implement different resources or strategies um, so we can learn from every incident that occurs. And then we've also, as you are aware, added the behavior interventionist roles. We've increased the total of our FTE and assigned them to buildings. So they're part of their tier two, three teams, tier three teams, and then part of their safety care response teams. And then they're helping coach um, behavior plans and taking implementation data for our teams on fidelity of implementation. And again, I think that role um, has been overwhelmingly positive. We've gotten a lot of feedback from our administrators that it's really helping um, to respond to those SEL needs in our buildings. Sounds like I have you. Any questions for me? Uh, it's a very interesting report and uh, very encouraging, I think. I just want to ask some questions just to make sure that I understand data as it's presented in the report. 
So looking at the first comparison, year-to-year uh, -year comparison slide that's, uh, what slide is this, four? Okay. And so I understand it, that those numbers are the number of restraint and seclusion instances for the entire year. <coughs> Do I have the right, right slide hold up? No, well, the, yeah, that, that the earlier. Go back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Okay. That, that right. Slide. These, right. yes. Yeah. These are the total number of incidences that occurred for those school years. Well, that year. So, yeah. uh, looking at the data for 2018 and 19, mm -hmm. as I understand it, this information says that there were 1,400 instances of restraint and conclusion in that school year. So this is a cumulative total. So 1,400 incidents of either seclusion, seclusion and restraint, or just for state. Okay, mm -hmm. that, uh, all right, that's what I was thinking. Then we go back to the slide uh, number seven, on page seven, chapter 103 data, uh, which is the one after this, I think. Mm -hmm. It's this one, okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> for the 22-23 school year, I can get the total number of incidents and restraint for that school year by adding the columns uh, number two, uh, restraint only 75, uh, <clears throat> number uh, column number four, incidents of seclusion only 10, and then uh, the last column, incidents of restraint and seclusion 11. So that is about uh, 85, 95, 96 total incidents for that school year. Correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So we're uh, comparing 96 then for that school year to 1,400 for four years earlier. Is that what correct. I'm looking at? And that's the same kind of uh, uh, tabulation, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, that's remarkable, obviously. Uh, can you can we have some comment about why we think we achieved that? Yeah, I think as I was, in, and obviously team, feel free to jump in, but again, I do think it's, uh, there's several contributing factors. One is we have looked at um, our systems and identified where we need to continue to allocate more, recess, need more resources, whether it be FTE, skill development, as far as professional learning, um, or coaching. And then we've really worked with our building administrators to develop a robust um, system with the goal to be more proactive and preventative, first of all, because we want to get our, catch our students early when they're struggling as opposed to waiting to when they're at an escalated and unsafe point. Um, but then in addition to that, it's really about um, using every student case as an opportunity to learn and grow with that student, identify what led to this event, and then how can we support that student to be more successful or having, obviously the goal is for every student that we see zero incidents of seclusion and restraint. So again, it's a <coughs> whole team working really hard to get, that, to get that outcome. Our paraeducators, our special education teachers, and our general education teachers, our administrators, our VIs, our SFAs, our facilitators. I mean, it, it really is everybody at the building level really committed to meeting every student's <coughs> need, their social, emotional, mental health being the most important because we know with those basic needs are met, they can't be learners. And so I just think it's a commitment, and, and I applaud our, our leadership team because it's been a collective commitment of our system to really target um, our students' basic needs, make sure their mental health, social, emotional needs are met so that they can be the best learners they can be. So we're going to dig anything you want to add? No, I think you did a nice job of covering it. I mean, I know we excluded the data sets from those COVID years, rightfully so, because, you know, we had interruptions in delivery model and things, but I, I think this has been a, a trend, right? I mean, we've been seeing this progress over a number of years, so it's it's not just something that turned on the dime. I, I think Ashley did a nice job uh, talking about how it just takes training <coughs> and time and energy and different ways of looking at it. and. Um, so it's not that it's always been easy, but I would give a big credit to the team and to our building teams on um, just being able to keep coming back to the table. You know, I mean, I, I think something that you know was said to us once was, you know, it's it's on that individual student level, right? That we have to keep going back to that individual students. It's a little bit easier to look at these large numbers and what do you do, but it really starts at that individual student level each time. Yeah. I mean, it is really remarkable. I, I commend the team and, and every one of our um, teachers and parents that are working with these students. And I, um, I understand um, that, of course, the goal is zero. You know, you, when you have that IEP meeting, you, you're not going to 
sit down with the parents and say, our goal is to restrain your child three times this year, right? Your, your, your goal is always going to be zero. Um, and then, of course, collectively for the district, the, the goal would therefore be zero. But um, I just hope that we're not putting ourselves in a position where we're trying to chase a, a number, a lower and lower and lower number, and having unintended consequences. Because, of course, the goal above all of that is safety. So, um, I mean, again, I commend, um, I commend the team. It's, it's, it's truly remarkable. It shows that our district can do hard things. Um, but, uh, you, you know, it, We've had some talk about whether or not it is appropriate to have a goal that we, that we think we can never meet because it's probably unrealistic. We're, I don't think we're ever going to get to zero. And you know, fortunately, we work with some really difficult um, situations. And so I, I hope that people don't look at this as a, as a failure if we never get to zero um, because it's probably not going to happen. But um, Again, I, I just want to stress that safety for our students and for everyone that works in our buildings, really, that's the goal. And, and the goal is that none of the, um, none of the restraints are ever inappropriately used. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, you know, and I, want, I, mean, I think the number's so dramatic that maybe people like, we want an answer to that, but you know, that's simple and, and more than just, oh, the team's doing a really good job. Um, I'm not saying that's not the right answer. I do believe that is. I, I just think when you go from this level um, to where we're at now, I, I guess maybe, I don't know this, because I know, you know, now we have to report all this to the state. Every district does. Are there any comparisons of districts, or is that not, I can understand if if that's not public, like every district doesn't necessarily want that information, but I just wonder how, you know, yeah, I, yeah. yeah how do we stack up to other districts comparable? Do we know? I don't know, um, and I'm sure we could look. We do all have to report out this, this information, so I could look. Um, I know, uh, so we're all part of a UEN like, director group, and I know in conversations with our special education director group, <coughs> Um, this is something, this is one area we talk about as a team frequently, and I think where our district maybe um, measures up differently than some of the other systems is the processes we've put in place, again, to be proactive. So we're the, we, the ADA is working towards having all systems implement a BIP fidelity structure. We've been doing that for four years now. Um, the level of coaching, we have an internal SCBH, special ed SCBH team. We're the only district that has that. I think about um, the, the behavior interventionist role and the way we utilize them. That's unique to our system. I, I do really think that it, it goes back to effective processes and, and checks and balances at all parts of your system and then really intensive um, coaching and support and, and taking it at that student by student level. Um, that has attributed to the numbers we've, we've gotten. in. And so I am curious, like where the state is in the process of doing an FP and BIP audit, um, other districts are starting to implement the implementation structures, so I'll be curious to see how that impacts other UEN's data in the future. But it's been nice because we've been a, a leader in all those areas and are, are working with the to develop those structures because we've been doing it. So. Yeah, it's exciting because what this means is, you know, it's um, having been a part of these, you know, <laughs> kind of situations and, and knowing how, um, you know, how scary they are for everyone involved um, and traumatic. I mean, that's on order of a thousand plus fewer of these dramatic incidences every single year. I mean, that's a dramatic change for kids. Um, kids who are struggling, you know. Um, and so to me, it's, it's got to reflect the underlying philosophy and, and just all of that hard work that's happening every single day. It's not a silver bullet, it's not a magic wand. It's just a lot of hard work by a lot of folks who are working to understand, kind of like we, we, a lot of us got this book, just trying to dig in deeper to behavior to understand what's going on um, and not just responding uh, in these uh, reactive ways. But So, thanks again. Great work. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Do you have a sense of the split between um, elementary and secondary in terms of numbers? 
we, restraints exclusion? We do. We have to be careful how we report out the numbers because our numbers are so low. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It becomes identifiable. Okay. But I guess my assumption would be there's more with younger kids? Yeah. Okay. And Director Reedy, thank you so much. Um, I, I will say that I have even noticed a difference in the schools. And um, you mentioned how it's more training, not just for um, special education teachers, but all teachers are invited to IEPs that encounter the students. And just how other students react when there is a situation unfolding in buildings. It's, it's remarkable to see how caring and understanding and how things still continue to flow when one of our students is struggling. And I think that has a lot to do with what the team is doing inside of our building. So thank you so much to you and the team. And a few more comments. Um, reflecting on what Director Finch was uh, 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 wanting us to consider and be careful about, um, it seems to me that to, to this reduction in the number of incidents indicates to me that the uh, the work the staff is doing, implementing all the steps that you've described, means that we've encountered uh, a lot of differences in behavior from student to student, and we've um, succeeded in responding to those differences uh, quite well. So it's, and I would suggest that, that these numbers suggest to me, and your presentation, suggest to me that the staff has learned many of the things that we would like to, that means that we can avoid uh, 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 dealing with students you know, who, who may need some additional support. We learned how to do that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think that's what, um, why it's so important and why we continue to highlight that work at the student level. Because um, I'm confident that any of um, our teachers, if they were standing with me today, would say every student case they've had the opportunity to problem solve with our team, work through these challenges, identify how to implement the plan, they become a better educator for it. I become a better educator when I'm participating in those meetings. My team becomes a better educator. Like, Every case is an opportunity to learn and grow, and then you take that learning and you apply it to the next case, and not that all of our students are the same, but you diversify your toolbox. And then you have more tools in your toolbox to respond to our students and to, and to meet their needs earlier and hopefully better, and that's all we can ask for. And we have, like I said, really committed people who are willing to, who are all in for our kids. And so, oh, yes. really grateful for that. Very evident. And I'll just conclude with you by asking the Superintendent Degner to add this data to our list of accomplishments that yeah. we uh, I just put it <laughs> into the board update, actually, for you guys and link the presentation in while we were sitting here. And um, my quick kind of to put a bow on this would be, this is one of those things when people want to talk about public education's failing, where I'd like to show them, right? And, and I don't want to pretend we got here on our own, right? I mean, this, this did take some, some community conversation, some uncomfortable moments for the district. Uh, but to Director Finch's point about we can do hard things, I think when you look at something like this, it's not a fun topic that people want to talk about. That's still a hundred incidents that, like JP had addressed that's really hard, really stressful, really traumatic for people involved. Um, but it's not 1,400, right? And the system does change, it does move, it does evolve, and it does accomplish and have great results for kids. I mean, last time we were together, we talked about closing achievement gaps, right? And proficiency gaps. This time we're talking about better serving our kids without having to restrain or seclude them. I mean, those are big wins, right, in a large system. And so I don't think those things can be underscored or understated um, probably enough uh, because um, it, it might not fit the narrative about what we hear about public schools, but this is uh, definite evidence to the contrary. Yeah, and I just want to clear up, you know, what I was trying to get at. And um, so I don't want to be a, a Debbie Downer here. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased with with the numbers, I just um, I, I I don't want us to just be chasing a number because I, I want to make sure that the reality um, on the ground is a, a situation where um, everyone is is safe. The student, the um, the teacher, you know. Um, it, sometimes it's it's hard to understand what the reality is when we're when we're looking at at the data. Um, so I just want to be realistic about things and and making sure that we're not just simply chasing a number 
um, and I'm, I'm sure that right now, I, I know that there's real growth here and that uh, we're doing the right things for, for our kids. Um, but I just want to you know, take a step back here and look at this critically and making sure that, um, well, you know, that, that we're, you know, that we're not just chasing a number. Because we, we are dealing with, um, with real issues here and because um, you know, what happens what happens next year when the numbers are a little bit higher? You know, it, it's at a certain point we can't continue to improve. It's probably never going to get to zero, unfortunately. And um, um, again, thanks. I know I know you guys are doing a good job. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased. I just wanted to clear up what I was trying to to convey there. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Next up, we have the website overview. Director Peterson or Dr. Ramey, you're going to take it up. Okay, go ahead. I think Kristen just knew she would transition this website at a time when people would be going there <laughs> on a frequent basis, like every half hour, an hour, to look for any weather update. So, well played there, Director Peterson. But we are excited to uh, welcome her and Allie here to the podium tonight to give an overview of the new website. They've done a tremendous amount of work to get that transitioned over uh, and ready to go for us. And so um, I'll let them take it away from there. Thanks, Matt. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to just start um, by introducing Allie. This is Allie Muller, and she is on our communications team. She uh, joined us in July, so she's fairly new, but right in the thick of the transition. So not the probably best time to start a new position, but I will tell you she hit the ground running and she's been instrumental in this process. So she deserves a tremendous amount of credit for this. Um, as you know, and as was stated, we launched last Monday and um, we're pretty excited about it. I will say, just a caveat, you know, it's just because we went live doesn't mean it's a finished product, right? We're still, um, it's a work in progress, it always will be. We're always looking to make our site more efficient, more easy to use, um, we're seeking feedback, because a lot of things you don't know until a site's live, right? You don't think, you can't necessarily work through all the bugs before you go live. So we're still doing that, but I will tell you we're very excited about where we're at, we're excited about the new capabilities. Um, we hope you guys get a chance to go dig around and, and explore too. So um, just a bit of backstory really quick. Um, this all started, we used to have Blackboard. Blackboard was our, 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 our website CMS, and they got acquired by Final Sight in the fall of 2022. So we were notified and we knew we were going to have to make a transition. We knew we were going to have to make a change because Blackboard was not going to be around any longer. We had about a two to three year window we knew we needed at some point to make that change. We decided to do it sooner rather than later, and the reason we did it is because Let's be real, we're in a new kind of school choice landscape now and everything looks a little different. Our jobs look a little different in how we approach things. We kind of have a, a marketing layer over everything that we do. And we thought this would be a really good opportunity to transition the website, give it a new look, give it a new feel, and kind of put that marketing lens over the top of everything. So we made the change, um, started a year ago. I'm gonna shift down here, I've got a little timeline, but. If you recall, back in February, you guys gave us the approval to move forward with this, so thank you again for that. Um, and that launched our designing and planning process, and it was really just came down to what do we want it to look like, what are some of the cool things we can do. Um, and then we did some research. We looked at other sites, what worked for other sites, what didn't work, and really got, get, gathered some inspiration from that. And then came the tedious process of looking at the content, cleaning it up, working with various groups to make sure we we're bringing over what needed to come over, but getting rid of duplicates, outdated information, all the stuff that didn't necessarily need to be there. So I want to just, I'll insert this little thank you right now. The groups, that, the admin team, school administration, our library teams, our curriculum teams, our counseling teams, we worked with all of them to determine what do we need to keep, what maybe doesn't need to be there anymore, what doesn't maybe belong. And so they were really instrumental in that process as well, just to make sure that we we're staying relevant and fresh and, and up to date. Um, so then we got to content migration, they brought everything over, and then came the fun part. We got to just start styling everything, right? Making it look good. Um, you're gonna, if you haven't already noticed, you'll probably notice there's a different tone, a different language on the site, right? It's just more conversational, more easygoing, less formal, um, which we felt was more inviting to users. And then we got to the launch, which is where we are now. So what we're gonna do now is 
just jump into a couple highlights that we want to show you. We want to do kind of a before and after for you. So Allie's going to kick it off with the first feature. Do you want to run that while you talk? Is that easier for you? Yeah. Okay. So we have the home page first. You can go to the home Oh, sorry. There is a slide in here that you'll see that's just some updated features and benefits. We're certainly not going to go through every bullet here, um, but take a look. If you have questions, we're happy to answer them, but, but this is just some of the updates from the normal <coughs> site. Okay, so home page. So the home page, as you guys has, have seen before. This is our, our, our before, yes. <laughs> and here's the home page now. Um, we have a lot of cool new features, more movement. We can go to the live site here. Um, really just kind of focusing on the user, the lens of the user, um, you know, making it simple, making it easy to find things. You can find things in multiple places, um, visually appealing, but also it does what it needs to do. And that's one of the things that we um, really focused on was restructuring, right? We found that a, a lot of the way the original site was set up was based on how we look for things, right? Being on the inside of the organization, not necessarily looking at it from the student's perspective or the parent's <coughs> perspective. So we really tried to organize, and you'll see um, at the top how we have it categorized. So, you know, these are our main categories, students and families, academics and programs, services and supports, versus having to go to the right department page to find that piece that you need. Now you go to what speaks to you more. Am I a parent? Yep, okay, I'll go to students and family, and I should easily be able to find everything that I need right there. Um, a couple of other key things on the home page is we've got these buttons that stick with you everywhere you go. We, we try to go with what was most important and roll, right? Any page you're on, you can click on that to enroll, right, if you're new to the district. Um, calendars. This is actually something we've added since we launched because we got a lot of feedback that calendars were harder to find. Um, so we went ahead and added that, that sticky button at the top so that it was there for on every screen, basically, that you visit. Careers, Nick was happy about this. He likes when we're constantly <laughs> promoting new jobs in the district. And then our staff portal. In addition to this, we've got the pop-out quick links on the side that follows you to every page as well with really those popular hotspots that people are constantly visiting, so. And then again, the social media on the side and then the enroll today on the side too. As yeah. well as you everywhere you go. And then going to the enroll and register page. Before, it was kind of confusing. There's a lot of buttons you could click. And just kind of plain, yeah. And here we are with after. And so now it's very direct for where families need to go, whether you're a preschool family, a kindergarten family, or grades one through 12, it's easy to navigate, visually plain, simple. All right. The next thing that we're in the middle of right now, if you have noticed our social media at all, is preschool registration. So. This is our previous preschool page, and here we are with after. Um, I will jump to the preschool page. Right off the bat, you've got your call to action at the top. You know, right? Our, our registration is February 8th. All the information you're gonna need there, a cute new day in the life of video that um, followed a little Lemmy student through her preschool day. We we're pretty excited about that. So this is all leading up to February 8th. As soon as February 8th hits and is passed, it's just gonna be a button here, register today, like enroll right now. Right? Just as simple as possible for families, but if they want to dive deeper, you can get into all the different um, the options and, and things that the program has to offer. The other cool thing we did is we talked to parents, and we have some quotes down here that you can scroll through from actual preschool parents in our district, right? Just testimonials. And then I don't know if you made it this far, but if you get a chance and can listen to some of these cute little preschoolers and their little voices, it's worth it. So. Um, the last piece, piece we want to highlight is our program of studies and our career pathways. Um, we're pretty excited about this, and I got to thank Carmen and her team and the collaboration to make this happen. If you recall, we've always had a printed book for our program of studies. We've never had an interactive component to that. Um, we put a PDF on the website. Well, that's not accessible. It's not translatable. So what we did was we built the program of studies in the system. It's now down here a little bit. It's searchable, so you can search for any course. It's categorized. If you open this up, you click on any one of these, it's going to have a pop-up window that gives you the course description and all the details that you need. We have one for middle school and one for high school. So pretty excited about that. I will say we did some research trying to find the best way to build this, and we were unable to find any other districts, and I'm not saying this is comprehensive because we would search every district, but the ones we did search we were unable to find um, 
any kind of interactive program of studies on the website. So um, we're excited that we could do this. It's the beautiful thing is it's translatable in any language. It's accessible. You can access it from anywhere, not just a paper copy. So right. So excited about that. The other piece is career pathways. This is another piece that Carmen helped a lot with and her team. Um, but we break it out by category. These are all the career pathways that we offer in our district. And if you click on any one of these, which I have one open, the creative arts pathway, you scroll down, it's going to give you your, your map, right? Your potential course sequence for your time in high school. And then down to electives, activities, <coughs> internships. So for each career pathway, you get the same page with all the details for that pathway. So. All right, I will open it up to um, any questions or discussion items, or maybe that's just it. <laughs> Directors? Well, I, this just looks uh, beautiful. Thank you. So blown away by the uh, difference in appearance and the access to information. Uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit about translation. Uh, that's something I talked about before I hear about still. Uh, have we been able to get uh, feedback from uh, speakers of different languages about how this actually works? I assume we're using a, a commercial product to do the translation, right? Yeah, so that it is actually an increased, that's not right, an improved translation product that we're using. Before it was just a Google Translate feature on our former site. Now it's a system called Weegla, and Allie's going to hover over it. But that's kind of our next step, right? I want to work with Laura Daly and her team to potentially get some of that feedback, right? Um, the, the thing about WeGlad is it's supposed to be an improved translation tool, improved accuracy, more languages. Um, but again, we don't always know, right? So I wanted to work with Laura's team to see, can we do some, can we have some spot checking? Maybe that's, that's the best thing. Because that's the beautiful part about WeGlad is if there's inaccuracies, we can go in and manually override them so that the translation is inaccurate when people switch to that particular language. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other directors? Well, I'll, I, I just had a comment. Um, at work, we recently underwent updating our website. And when this came live, I went to my boss and said, whatever they're using, we need. Because this looks so fresh and clean. And I don't think it took them nearly as long as it's still taking us. Don't go visit my site. We have so many broken links. And I, I sat there and I was clicking on links to see so I could say, no, this was well done. Remind me again, what platform is this? Is this Drupal? Final site. Final site. Okay. Way better than Drupal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No comment. It looks great. It's one really. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Well done. Next up, we have District Career and Academic Plan. Dr. Ramey, is that <coughs> Well, sure. Good evening again. Um, this is a plan that we've just seen to present on a yearly basis. And so Carmen and Paul Lindsay, I think, are going to walk you through it. And then Carmen, Lindsay, myself, and the rest of the team are available for any questions you might have. Lindsay? Yes. Hi. I am happy to be here. How do I get to my presentation? Sorry. <laughs> this is all new for me, so. All right, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. My name is Lindsay Schluckabier again, and I am the curriculum coordinator here in the district for our school counseling program and health program. And as part of um, that role, I am also um, one of our leaders on our district career and academic plan. I'm so excited to talk to you a bit about that today. Um, here on the next slide, you also see our other leaders on our academic <coughs> plan, or our, our DCAP team, sorry. And um, we have on that team um, Dominic, who is our career and tech ed curriculum coordinator. We have Russ and Rick, who are career development facilitators at our high schools. And um, we also have had the privilege to add K-12 
Kayla Strand, who is um, an employee of Kirkwood Community College as part of our partnership with, with them. She's our career and college transition counselor. And she is, while she's employed with Kirkwood, she is um, works directly with our three comprehensive high schools. So we have a really robust leadership team supporting this plan and supporting our um, goal of helping students graduate um, college, career, and life ready. Uh, so we're really excited to share this with you today. Now I've just got to figure out. You just have to scroll. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's not as easy as sitting here. It's all right. It's like a different control. system. It's okay. <laughs> add to a little bit of nerves anyway, so okay. uh, So this is the outline of what I'm going to be talking to you about today, and my plan is just to tell you a little bit about our DCAP and how it fits with our district's future ready vision, um, share a little bit of data and um, what we're doing with that data, what our next steps are, and uh, at the end, if you have questions, we'll be time for that as well. So our state um, mandates that we, um, that districts create a comprehensive career and academic plan. And what you see here are the pieces, the components that need to be included in those plans. So we have to address academic proficiency, right? Content proficiency, academic skill readiness, um, transition skills, and <coughs> social, emotional, work ready, life ready skills, right? And then a couple of years back, they added a component around work-based learning. So really wanting to ensure that students are getting those workforce skills and preparation uh, in order to, again, when they graduate, be ready for whatever their post-secondary path is. So we use the terms college and career ready often, but we know that college isn't for all of our students, and that's okay, or a four-year college may not be for all of our students. So we're very <coughs> intentional with talking about post-secondary goals, whatever those might be, whether those are just going directly into the workforce, maybe it's um, going to community college, maybe it's going to a four-year university. Whatever those are, we're wanting students to have the opportunity to explore, um, build that self-awareness, and um, create goals to um, think about whatever their path may be. So within this, umbrella of career and academic planning. I'm talking to you about the specific district career plan that we have to come up with that says, how are we going to address all of these different areas within the realm of college and career future ready, right? And a component of that, which you may have heard about depending on how long you've been around the state, is the individual career and academic plan. So that's the um, the specific plans that individual students make for themselves that go within that district career and academic plan. Here on this slide, we do have this year's DCAP linked in, and you can review that um, if you choose. I'm not going to make you sit here and look through. It's, it's very comprehensive, which is great. Um, but we're not going to go into every single aspect of it today, so this is just an overview. Some highlights, though, that we did want to make sure that you're aware of um, are that the team, I showed you some individuals within that core leadership team, but our team is much larger than that. So we have diverse representation from multiple stakeholder groups, uh, which helps us make sure that we, are, um, that we have a plan that's inclusive, accessible, that is doable, um, and that it aligns with where we want to go um, in our district and what we want for our graduates. We have a career information system called Zello, and it is a tool that allows us to do a lot of those, learn, provide a lot of those learning activities for students to build those, um, to build that self-awareness, um, they're able to engage in activities where they can learn about themselves and what that means for future goals. Um, they start to build some of those social, emotional, and um, you know what sometimes is referred to as those soft skills to help them be life ready, to help them be able to uh, be adaptable, right? All those portrait of a graduate competencies that we talk about, to be critical thinkers, to be able to um, 
engage collaboratively with diverse people out in the world, right? So Zello is a tool that we use and we lean on heavily and it helps us to um, do a lot of that, provide a lot of those activities for learning for our students. And we are able to um, create career-related experiences at every level, um, 8 to 12, for 8th through 12th grade um, is where DCAP as a state, where we're required to um, have activities laid out for each of those grade levels. Of course, we're going to do career exploration things, um, activities, K-12, um, but as, and for the purpose of, of this plan, sorry, it's really around K-12. And then that individual career and academic plan includes a, um, students in eighth grade are to build a four-year plan. And that may sound ridiculous. You're like, why, how are eighth graders? And our eighth graders sometimes are like, I have no idea what I want to do for these four years or when I graduate. And so we're really clear about making sure students know this is not like set in stone. This is not what you put here as an eighth grader for your four-year plan. You cannot deviate from this at all, right? We talk about it's a living plan and we expect that for a lot of our students it will change. And that's okay. It's really about learning from learning about yourself, learning from your experiences, what your skills are, what your strengths are, your interests, what um, values you have, what you want your lifestyle to be like, right? So we're building those um, opportunities for students to really learn more about themselves and to use that information to make choices about the classes that they're taking. So Kristen was able to show you those um, career pathways and how our courses are outlined um, within some of our career pathways. So we're really trying to give students a lot of opportunities to explore, get information so that they can make choices and we can make that course registration and um, the choices that students are making really meaningful for them and to help them to see all of these as relevant to not just what they're doing right now within our system, but <coughs> when they leave our district. So within the DCAP, there are what's called five essential components, and those you'll see here. So what I have um, shown you on this slide is what specific activities we have built in within each of these components so far this school year. So I'm just showing you what we did in the fall, and um, these are just really small snapshots. But for self-understanding, I mentioned Zello as our career information system. All of our students, because this is the first year we've used Zello um, in all of our schools, so for all of our students, we had them engage in a matchmaker assessment, which is just an opportunity to learn more about themselves and to answer some questions, again, related to interests, values, um, lifestyle, things that they're looking for, right? And it aligns with, they get results that align with uh, careers that match up, right? Matchmaker, make, matchmaker that'll line up with those um, answers to the questions that they answered. And then they have the opportunity to explore more about those careers and learn more about what, um, what the training, what the education would be if they wanted to get into those careers. Of course, salary range. So there's lots of information that they can dig into deeper um, once they get those assessment results. And they are, um, then they can explore career matches. So we build, it's a scope and sequence, right? We build as they go through our system, they're digging into this a little bit more, getting more specific about what their plans might be. Um, so they're exploring those career matches, what does that look like? Um, we also are really excited that we were able to offer um, experiences for students at each level. So we have um, different field trips and fairs and things like that that they're able to do starting in eighth grade where they can get some hands-on experiences and learn from different industries. And that's really exciting and students really always enjoy those experiences. Um, as they get into 11th and 12th grade, we get really a lot more detailed with our post-secondary exploration. 
so they are able to go on college visits. We have um, a partnership with what's called VIEW Scholarship Platform, where students can uh, learn more about different scholarships that are available to them. Uh, we have different, for in that a component of career and post-secondary decisions, um, students can have the opportunity to take the Abbott elective. We have um, our counselors going in and meeting with and talking to students about different uh, things to be thinking about. So we have, they're talking about FAFSA with our senior students and um, building resumes and applying for schools and all those different things that they could be doing. And then I believe you've seen this slide before. So um, within that Zello career system, our students have been able to save careers. And so we've been able to see what our students are most interested in and um, aligned with our service areas. And then we've started to build those pathways that line up with what our students are telling us they are interested in pursuing. And as we continue to get data from students, if, diff if other careers become high interest areas, then we can build additional pathways. Right? We're not stuck to what we have there now. That's a starting place based on this data. And we'll continue to um, add to that as students give us more information and maybe their interests change. So some takeaways from the data we've gotten so far and from our plan so far this year are um, it's exciting to see increased numbers um, and our students really engaging in the system. So we've had some different <coughs> systems in the past and we still have a long ways to go, but our numbers of student engagement are higher than they've been in the past. And it shows that um, as a system, more people are aware of the importance of um, career and academic planning that we're doing with our students and um, are helping and are using the system as a tool. And we're going to continue to enhance our le lessons and activities um, to increase engagement and to do more differentiation from grade level to grade level as well. Um, we're going to continue to look at that data and to amplify the importance of our work. So sharing the data back out with buildings. So this is what your numbers look like. How can we um, continue to increase student engagement? Um, maybe we're saying, you know what? Our 10th graders aren't really engaged in that. Let's figure out why, right? So we want to make sure that all students are um, participating and learning about themselves and um, starting to build their goals and think about their futures. And um, we have, you know, I showed you some of those core team members at the beginning. Um, so our career development facilitators, our college and career transition counselor, our school counselors. Um, there's lots of people. We have our um, TAP for our special ed, so our trans I believe it's transition alliance partnership. So within our special ed um, department, all of those people are supports for when we start to see um, maybe students who aren't engaging, who maybe don't have um, their plans established, who maybe we see when they're doing their course registration, um, their electives aren't aligning with what they're saying they're interested in. Like we can use all of those supports to do more one-on-one um, -on -one or small group interaction with students too. Um, to start making, I mean, to make sure that all of our students, again, are engaged in this process. And um, we're really going to use that data to try to make our course registration process more meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge goal of ours in this career pathways and the program of studies and the accessibility of that on our website is, and just the collaboration we're doing across departments in the district is really, I mean, it's a beautiful thing and I'm really excited about, like, students not just checking the boxes, not just, and, and not just being fit into um, wherever there are lower numbers, right, in classes, or, oh, I know my friends are taking this class, so I'm gonna take this class. We're probably never gonna get completely away from that, but really trying to help them think about, oh, if I'm interested in education, then let me look at this pathway. What are some electives that I can take in line with that? And then maybe I learn, oh, actually, I don't like that. And that's okay, too, right? So. 
um, that's probably what I'm most excited about is really having that process be really meaningful. And then what we have next um, for this year, and this is both things that students will be doing and things that our team will be doing. So um, FAFSA is a big piece right now, and um, now that the new FAFSA is live, we're doing a lot of awareness building for um, our seniors and um, our families to make sure that they're filling out that FAFSA right and have um, that information about financial support and aid. Registration is going to be kicking off here really soon, so making sure we're utilizing that student data um, and pathways tool and to help that be more meaningful for students. We're going to continue those lessons within Zello, and um, in the spring, we'll have our eighth graders build their four year plans, and um, we'll have our ninth um, through twelfth graders review and revise their plans. We're going to continue to work across departments. Um, that cross curricular collaboration is super important. And then our team, our DCAP team, needs to action plan for what went well this year, what do we need to do different next year. Okay? So I just gave you a lot of information. Um, how questions? Thank you so much. And directors, if you have questions, Director Easter. Uh, thanks, uh, President Malone. Um, <clears throat> I just want to ask if we're your in contact with people in the community that may be partners that to provide internship and job shadowing uh, opportunity support. I know the University of Iowa Labor Center is uh, heavily uh, is developing that now, and I assume that's one of your uh, ongoing partners. Yes, absolutely, and thank you for asking that question, especially um, Dominic Adia and Carmen, who is our work-based learning, I'm so sorry, teacher? We have one of our new rural teachers. He's a teacher on site for our internship experience classes right now. Um, so that's my move. Um, okay. But we also work directly with Dominic and then with our work-based learning center from Kirkwood. And we build all of our internship and registered apprenticeship. Dominic has been doing an amazing job this year for getting our students in our registered apprenticeship programs, especially through education and through health. And so a lot of our students who are in our career our own program right now for education are going through that process with him. Um, and they're getting both Kirkwood credit and um, high school credit for those experiences. So it's built in our new program of studies. If you look in the bottom link, the last link, it says workplace learning mm -hmm. um, classes. And we have built in there all of our new internship and registered apprenticeship programs are in the program of studies for this year. Are there construction trades in the yes. group two? Yeah. So he's working through a lot of our students who are in the geometry and construction class right now. And then our student builds homes, those projects too. We're working directly with them. We have a welding is another big one that we have students who are directly, I have a student who graduated early and second try and already has a job with Kinsey and is going to be working directly with Kinsey starting third try. And so we have, we're building all those programs for the students. Great. Great. Thanks very much. Any additional court questions from directors? It all looks great. Yeah, it's really exciting. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much for being with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Next up is our action item for tonight. I would entertain a motion to approve the application to SBIC <coughs> for modified supplemental amount for environmental hazards. Uh, I move that we approve the School Budget Review Committee application for a modified supplemental amount for abatement of environmental hazards in the amount of $130,091.90. Second. Board Secretary Coleman, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is our legislative update. Um, you'll see that our first forum is this Friday from 4 to 5, usually right here in the boardroom. At this time, I'm uncertain if I'll be able to make it because we have a work event that doesn't end until 4.30. <laughs> So, um, and the session is open and underway, so I don't know if Superintendent Degner had comments. Yeah, 
probably three things to note in the governor's omnibus bill um, that I'm sure we'll talk about more on Friday or if you want any more specific information on you can uh, certainly contact me uh, start with kind of the positive would be the increase to teacher salaries that's proposed um, that would really help our district on the front end of the teacher salary schedule most of our are our first steps at like 43,800 uh, maybe I'm not sure if I have that exact number right but getting that uh, to 50,000 would of course help the new folks that we're bringing in um, the more career teacher aspect they're talking about with 62,000 the top end of our schedule really has uh, people well positioned there um, it does seem like they're going to group districts into tiers uh, 3,000 above or 3,000 or smaller and then they're going to funnel the money to us through the TSS and so we're uh, still waiting to learn how that all shake out and how that'll work but um, that's an overall positive thing for teachers in the state and so we're we're also excited about that. Uh, the governor also proposed 2.5% for SSA, and you'll probably remember that's what we built into our budget forecasting model. So um, if it holds with the governor's proposal, those uh, projections we've been showing you will be accurate. Um, and then the one that's probably created the most controversy throughout the state would be the AEA re reorg or redesign. Um, for us, just a couple numbers, we have $5.3 million that are flowed through dollars to the AEA for special ed services. Um, that's the only portion they're talking about the districts could do something different with. We have another $2 million that goes to the AEA uh, for media and ed services. That $2 million under this plan would just go away. It would be given back in property tax relief. And so the district would have to absorb any expenses, uh, things we would have to recreate or do on our own that are in the media or ed services category. The 5.3 is what the, if this passes, they're telling us we'd have to make a decision on by April about if we would be able to take on um, and stand up that ourselves in the district, if we continue to partner with an AEA, if we want to continue to partner with private providers uh, for some of those services. Uh, for those that work in the uh, special education field, know there's a, there's a comprehensive set of the services that they provides that goes beyond the scope of what the district does right now. I uh, just want you to think about the child find process, identifying students for special education. That's not, we're of course partners in that work and work on the referral aspect, but we don't do the child find independently. And so that'd be a whole new aspect of work the district would take on. So nevertheless, we're evaluating that to know, okay, if we had to hire those positions, what would that mean for the district? Um, and doing an analysis on what that $5.3 million would mean to us because um, even though it's not a law yet, they already sent us an email saying you're gonna have to state your intentions by April 30th. There's already jobs posted at the Department of Education. Um, and I, I would say just my read and one thing I want to echo, it is a little bit concerning about the consolidation of uh, probably authority and power uh, to the director of the Department of Education in terms of special education that a lot of that has been generally been a framework throughout the state, throughout the AEAs, and this really consolidates it to the Department of Ed for Special Education. Um, assuming best intent, uh, we do struggle with achievement of special education students in Iowa in comparison to our peers, um, but I think that's also, um, there's a telling fact that we also identify students for special education in a very unique way um, in comparison to our peers throughout the country. We really use a um, assessment based model and scores where it's really a diagnosis based model in some other states and so it's not really an apples to apples comparison when looking at the pool of students uh, similar to even you know you guys asked the comparison question about 103 data that would be a little bit tricky knowing that you know they might have a different percentage of students in special ed the makeup of students could be different with their goals and so um, hard to do that comparison but assuming best intent they're trying to look for better outcomes in special ed um, the AAs have been the backbone of doing that. Um, whatever, wherever we end up in Iowa City, I think we'll be much better positioned to deal with the transition. Um, I would be very concerned as a rural school district superintendent about uh, what that means and what that's going to look like in the future. I have a follow-up question, and, and maybe you don't know the answer, but the teacher pay legislation proposed by the governor, which is great, um, but what is her plan for continuing that level of funding? Because the teacher pay obviously comes from the general fund. So are they going to give a bump to SSA to make a, I, you know, I get that. So for one year, we'll get this big chunk of change and we can raise everybody's starting pay. 
what's the plan to sustain that moving forward year after year, or have they not illuminated their thinking on that? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter there. I'm not sure they've illuminated the thinking. I, I you know, I think there's some. There, there's, and I'm probably going to misspeak to this, and Adam or Brady might have looked into it in a little bit more detail than I have, but you know, there is the one-time money that, you know, through TSS that will get that started. We'll continue to get an allocation of TSS to support, you know, teacher salaries in the state. Um, of course, there's still some long-term projection problems with that, right? Supporting salaries, supporting the amount of people we have, and the growth of SSA. And so um, I think all of those things, no matter how the math breaks breaks down from where they're coming from, it's still kind of, we have to consider it's coming from the state who is decreasing the revenues they're bringing in. And at some point, um, there's some of these things that are supported by one-time grants, um, like even work-based learning connections, which would connect back to our last uh, presentation. I was talking to a legislator this morning, they asked what their plan for that is, uh, because they're zeroed out in the AEA funding plan here. Well, they're gonna support it with one-time money that really comes from some of the federal dollars. Well, what happens after that? And there aren't answers to those questions. There aren't answers to the questions about what happens when declining revenues at the state in 27, 28 are expected to fund two ed systems and now, you know, increases they make. And so positives, but yes, I think there's there's great reason to be skeptical about what the state's gonna be able to sustain or what districts will need to sustain in the future. Um, but it is a good move for employees. We know we're in the middle of a teacher shortage. It's only going to increase in the short term uh, for that shortage and for us to stay competitive with surrounding states. Um, we do need to do something about that pay. Great. I have a uh, couple questions for you. Yeah. Since we're at the end of the meeting, I'll just throw them. Uh, the um, first, when you when you talk about tiers and that funding, the three thousand above, three thousand below. What is that? usually entail, or what, what does that mean? Adam, do you mind expanding yeah. on that some more? Yeah, so essentially what that is, is in order to determine what the amount of TSS is going to be <coughs> on a per student basis to districts in the state, the state is breaking all districts into districts above 3,000 enrollment, districts below 3,000 enrollment, and then looking at what the average amount per student is, that would get all of those districts up to the 50,000 minimum and the 62,000 minimum based on what they currently pay their new teachers and what they currently pay their uh, teachers who are in their 12th year of service, 12th year of service, right? Yep. Yeah, 12th year of service. Um, and so we are likely to see a lower per student TSS amount because we're in the above 3,000 enrollment group than the districts that are in the below 3,000 enrollment group where, because those are mostly rural districts, salaries tend to be lower, and so those districts on average are going to require a greater TSS infusion in order to reach those, those statutory minimums. So, I mean, that's kind of why they broke it out, because it makes it, it creates a situation where uh, not all districts are necessarily going to get whatever the statewide average would need to be in order to get all districts up to that point. Does that make sense? And I guess the, the further question would be, the, for districts that are already high, for example, does this necessarily hurt them? And do they get less money, more money, or anything like that? No, they, they would get the same, whatever the okay. per student allocation is by group, by their tier, rather. Um, you know, and essentially that would create some additional funds that can be invested in teacher salaries in that case. So mm -hmm. um, TSS funds have to go to teacher salaries. Uh, it is possible that a district like us that already has relatively high salaries, although as Superintendent Degner mentioned, we certainly have a ways to go to get up to that 50,000 minimum. Um, but it potentially could give a district like us a little bit more cushion there. Thank you. Uh, the next question, and Matt, feel free to give it to whomever in your group that would like to answer it. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of commentary on AEA and special education, which is rightfully so. Uh, but you talked about the two million dollar pass through for curriculum. Could you comment what kind of curriculum and curricular supports the district receives from the AEA or the AEAs? Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more in generalities because I would say, you know, part of what we're also trying to understand is what we would be probably without. You know, there's some things that we've just kind of assumed, but 
when we think about some of the professional learning opportunities that we send staff to at a greatly discounted rate, a lot of those and don't have anything to do with special education necessarily, right? But we still engage in those. They still offer a learning session. We may even pay in a portion, but they're able to greatly reduce the rate that we're able to do that. Printing services is another thing that, you know, especially smaller districts probably use more for the AA. Again, here, I'm not sure we rely on those printing services um, too much in that regard. Um, and media services. Um, so you think about the media services or the, the ed support side, uh, we do have other positions that also uh, come down to, to support and work with the district. So we have regional administrators and not all of their role is related to special ed or we have PBIS coaches that would come in and help um, also work with, with district staff. And so there's support positions, I would say, that are instructional technology positions uh, that the AEA also houses and funds um, that those flow through dollars are used for. Um, but what we're in the process of doing is basically trying to figure out what is that comprehensive list and what does that mean to us if we don't have those. And so there will be some impact on cost of those things or just lost opportunity, you know, for the district. Um, there's professional learning for even for our administrators, right, that, that I engage in on a monthly basis with other superintendents that I'm assuming we wouldn't continue to do or that um, our position alike groups uh, have to have the opportunity to participate in now. So. Those would be a couple things in generality, but we'll be bringing back some more information on that. And I do, you know, the district will have to make a decision by the end of April about what direction we want to go with that, assuming this continues to move forward. Some of the current lobbying efforts are trying to get them to uh, basically break this bill into parts and take the teacher pay piece by itself, take the AEA piece by it. Um, I know as a UEN group, we registered a post to the bill, the omnibus bill, with the note, of course, that we're not opposed to teacher salary increases. We're opposed to the timing and how fast the AEA piece has moved. And yes, there may be some valuable conversation to be had, but don't do it this fast, right? Take a year of study it, dig into it some more. Sorry, Mitch, I kind of went off on a little tangent there, but do you have a follow-up? Yeah. I'll be interested to see um, what our, <clears throat> hear from our local legislators, what their colleagues in rural parts of the state feel about the AEAs, because I think that's where, um, I imagine that's where the governor's going to have a hard time with some of these small districts that really mm -hmm. lean on AEAs for lots of different expertise and services. Yeah. I agree with that. So looking forward to Friday. Next up is our director liaison reports. I don't know if directors had any comments about activities. Director Williams. Yeah, I just want to highlight something that I went to on December 19th. Um, I don't know how many people know, but um, Chip Hardesty is a paraeducator at City High. He runs the Success Center. Um, I know him because he started the City High Mock Trial Program, and I've had the pleasure of coaching with him for over a decade now. Um, he suffered a really serious um, health event on during the homecoming parade. And um, I just wanted to highlight that I'm very, very grateful that the Iowa City Police Department um, had sent officers to help with the parade that day. Um, the presentation I attended um, was the Life Saving Award Ceremony <clears throat> for the officer who actually ended up saving Chip's life due to this health event. Um, he also had to use that a D defibrillator, which the Johnson County Emergency um, Management Program has really been pushing to get out into our communities, um, and they do an amazing job of saving people's lives in these um, types of events. So I just wanted to express some gratitude to the police department, um, to the emergency services, uh, the ambulance and, and um, EMTs that responded, um, and supporting our schools and our personnel and, and reaching a really good outcome there. Um, really grateful that they were there that day. Thank you, Director Williams. Any additional comments? Okay, next up is agenda setting. We will kick it off with policy and governance right at five o'clock in the back of the room. Looks like 500 series and policy primers will be that night. And immediately following that, we will have a exhibit session. So, and then that will take us to our regular six o'clock meeting. Um, 
The standard items are listed as well as our equity update, Superintendent Decker, reminding again what's our education showcase that night and equity update. Um, educational showcase, I don't, I don't, KP, do you know? It's the fall athletics. Thank you, yes, fall athletics, that's right. Okay. Um, and then the equity update is some follow-up uh, to just that conversation we've been having go, um, having in an ongoing way about supporting our all, all students, kind of thinking about tragedies um, around the globe right now uh, with some special attention to that in the Middle East and uh, some follow-up there that our team's been working on to try to share some resources and demonstrate some um, compassion and empathy to those involved. Uh, so those will be the two topics for those with you. Great. And we'll have the mental health work group presentation as well as a discipline update and an annual audit report. And I don't know if directors had anything that they wanted to remind us of about what's in a parking lot. And I know that's a running list on the board update, so feel free to either share that now or reach out to Superintendent Degner so he can get that added. Okay. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is adjourned.